name is Tara Rowe. I'll be moderating today's session. And Michelle, I just saw you private message me. I love that we get to connect like this. Uh, Michelle is a parent of a student that I work with. So I'm going, I actually asked Iris if she would share introductions just because I, um, as one of the speakers, she has a little bit more uh, background knowledge and has a better understanding of who, who's who and putting faces to names. So as you're joining in, please go ahead and mute yourself. Um, we're gonna get started in just a few minutes. We will be recording today's session. And if you do have questions for the, uh, the speakers for today, if you use the event Moby um, conference platform, then your questions won't disappear once our Zoom session ends. But if you type your questions into the chat, then um, after the session, those questions and those responses will kind of disappear. So that's why I was asking about breakfast because we don't necessarily need that in the conference app. But if you do have questions about how to get in touch with someone or if you'd like more information or just anything that the, ses um, the presenters will be sharing today, if you use the conference app, it'll be there a whole lot longer. So on that note, Iris, if you want to take it away and share who you are and what you're doing today. Thank you, Tara. Hi, I'm Iris Neal, and I um, am a consultant for the Unicorn Children's Foundation. I've been working with them oh, for m multiple years, and um, today we're presenting on how we have been collaborating within the community, and we're really excited to share all that we've been doing. Sharon Alexander is the CEO of the Unicorn Children's Foundation, and Carrie Morris, um, she is a consultant with the foundation as well, and but her main her her main consulting is with the the children the children's foundation and working with getting projects and programs started for for people with disabilities and special needs. So I'm going to give it over to Sharon. Thank you, Iris. It's my pleasure to be here this morning. Um, our our title is Refining Collaboration in Palm Beach County, but I really want to stress that. Um, it's it's not just specific to Palm Beach County. Um, we you know it's really about building community where you're at, and community can be defined as many different things. It could be defined as a faith-based community. It could be your neighborhood. Um, it could be an even larger community. But really, how are we working together to really reshape the landscape of services and supports for individuals with uh, disabilities and making the communities uh, more inclusive and comprehensive and helping families navigate what's a very co uh, complex system of care. Um, so we're gonna go over a few things today. We're gonna, um, what, my button's not working. I knew that was gonna happen. Hold on, let's see if I can get it to work. All right, let's, oh, there we go. All right, so our learning objectives today are to really um, explain to you who Unicorn Children's Foundation is, what our key initiatives are, um, how we've been able to establish a community collective impact project, um, talking to you about innovative social enterprises and partnerships that actually um, help to increase sustainability and understanding how to successfully take initiatives virtual because this past year has been unlike any other that we've seen. Um, and we've really had to make uh, intentional choices to make sure that we're still able to serve our community um, despite the pandemic, um, what those challenges have brought in terms of, you know, silver linings as well as uh, not so silver linings. So we're gonna try and condense all of that into 45 minutes and leave some time for Q and A. So the Unicorn Children's Foundation is really dedicated to creating cradle to career pathways for kids and young adults with developmental and learning disabilities, as well as helping their families navigate a very complex journey. Um, and when we talk cradle to career, we're talking, you know, from that early identification and intervention up through community integration, vocational training and employment supports. And our vision is that, you know, we'd like to see a world where all children, regardless of, regardless of their disabilities, have every opportunity to be included in the communities um, and, and find meaning and purpose in their lives. Um, and, and I really like to, um, one of our initial collaborators was Dr. Stanley Greenspan with the floor time model, and he, said that it was our obligation to create a world where all children 
regardless of their disabilities, have the potential to flourish. And that's really been a guiding principle um, of ours. So our primary focuses are connecting families to resources, advocating for inclusive opportunities, respecting differences, empowering individuals and supporting success. And the way we do that is through integration, coordination, cooperation, and collaboration. Um, you know, the old saying, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, when you're talking about individuals with disabilities, um, it, it, it's even more important that we create that village. So just to give you a brief overview of our collaborative history, um, Unicorn Children's Foundation was started 26 years ago um, with the goal of reimagining what's possible through these connections, advocacy, respect, empowerment, and support. Um, we started initially as a grant-making organization, um, started as a family foundation, and we still have those familial roots 26 years later that really um, help propel us forward. Um, when we started as a grant-making organization, um, when our, again, our first collaborator was Dr. Stanley Greenspan, um, and we helped them, we funded the development of the Interdisciplinary Council on Developmental and Learning Disorders, um, who had a fabulous annual conference that brought providers, parents, and policymakers from around the world to really discuss best practices. Um, and from there, we've kind of evolved. You know, we've collaborated with local universities, with uh, Nova Southeastern University. We provided funding for an endowed chair in learning and developmental disorders. They've now established a developmental clinic um, at Nova Southeastern University. We moved from there, um, I, joined, I joined the team 15 years ago um, to really create a more strategic programmatic direction. So we continued that collaboration with universities, with University of Miami, with Nova Southeastern University, with um, FAU. And again, I'm talking about, you know, we like to build our programs locally um, not with the intention of keeping them local, but it's much more manageable if it's in your own backyard. But our whole goal with every one of our programs is really to create a model that we can replicate in any community. So the programs we'll talk to you about today um, are things that you can take back to your own community. And we are here to help you and guide you with that. So from the physical clinic, um, we moved to University of Miami and to FAU to provide mobile developmental screening clinics. These were intended to get out into underserved areas of the community to uh, provide assessments or screening tools and then to connect families to resources. In 2013, we realized that um, that transition period, that high school period, um, while high schools, the public high schools were doing an adequate job of helping families and, and, and young, young teens um, in that transition period. We just felt there was something that we could do to optimize uh, that, that, that period. So we did establish the Unicorn Village Academy in 2013. Since then, 100% of the graduates from that program have gone on to post-secondary programs or have entered employment uh, or pre-employment pre internships or imp actual employment. Um, so we're, re we're really proud of that. Um, that program is really focused on functional academics, daily living skills, community integration and vocational training. Um, we've created some programs to address the earlier ages such as our Creating Compassionate Children programs um, to really help reduce the stigma of disabilities among peers in preschool and elementary programs. Um, in 2015, once we've established, we had established those first programs, we really wanted to take a look at what was our next big project going to be, but we didn't want to do it alone. Um, while we had the funding available to go out and, and from our, you know, academic high tower saying this is what we feel the community needs we thought it was much more important to actually hear from the community. So in 2015, we decided to do a community needs assessment in Palm Beach County to understand what the landscape of services and supports looks like and to really hear where the gaps and barriers were. From that community needs assessment, um, it was a multi-funder collaborative. Um, we were able to create the special needs advisory coalition. 
This is a group that started with 50 people in a room um, in January up in West, in West Palm Beach. Um, we now have well over 575 members representing 160 different organizations uh, that come together monthly. And I will, I will share that it is not 575 people that meet monthly. We have a, a, a smaller core group, um, but we do weekly e-newsletters to educate the community about what's going on, um, sharing different events and calendars. And we've got some outcomes that Iris is gonna share with you later. Um, talking about best practices, innovative solutions, uh, but really making the special needs community a more cohesive unit. Um, at the same time, we did start with some parent coaching scholarships because we realized, you know, as parents, when you receive that diagnosis from a medical professional, um, it can be really overwhelming. Um, but parents truly are the experts on their child. Even if you're taking your child to different interventions or different programs, or you're dropping them off at school, the parents are the ones that are with the child the bulk of the day. And when I say child, again, I, I know we're talking transition. Um, they're all my children. You know, I have kids from my early intervention days that are now in their twenties. They're still my kids. So, I, so please don't take offense to the kids term. Um, we also have um, focused on expanding, um, oops, sorry about that. Okay, um, we brought in some respite, uh, best practice respite programs into the community. We worked with Project Search to create a pre-employment internship program. And then Carrie's gonna talk to you about our newest initiative, which should have launched um, in March of 2020, but as we know, um, all of our plans kind of got um, halted with the pandemic, but we engaged in some innovative practices to make sure that we were staying strategically aligned with our goals um, so that once we can transition back to in-person, um, it will be a pretty seamless process. So Palm Beach County um, in particular, and I'm sure it's not unlike many others, you know, one in six children nationally are diagnosed with a developmental or learning disorder. Uh, Palm Beach County in particular has the third largest population of people with disabilities in Florida. Um, statistically, we know that 60% of students with a disability report being bullied regularly. I'm sure I don't have to tell many of you here, the annual cost of traditional therapies um, averages about $60,000 per year for families. Um, at one point, when I first got into this field, um, all of that was out of pocket expense because insurance wasn't covering interventions because insurance deals with medical issues and the interventions they looked at as educational in nature. But fortunately, that started to change. We know that 35% of parents are reporting feeling isolated, guilty, or stressed about their children's future, especially as they're entering into transition periods and parents are, be, are aging. 62% um, of individuals nationally with a disability are unemployed or underemployed. 26% um, are living below the poverty level and uh, people with disabilities, and this is probably, I should say all of us now, are two to three times more likely, likely to experience social isolation. Um, so I think the pandemic has been interesting because for those who haven't, uh, who, who don't have a disability, um, this last year has allowed us to really experience what it might be like to uh, live in that social isolation. And ultimately we know that once the school bus starts, stops coming, um, there are very few supports or services available after the age of 22. So while our, the foundation's initial focus was on the early identification and intervention. As we've grown, um, our focus is now really shifting to that, that transition age and what happens after 22 so that we can fill those gaps. So when we talked cradle to career pathways, one of the first things we did is we looked at the developmental tra trajectory that we all go through, right? From prenatal all the way through adulthood. And it's not very different for individuals with disabilities, but they just require some additional supports or services along the way. So we started looking at, okay, what is it that families need? 
So in that young adulthood transition age period, we know post-secondary education is necessary <clears throat> and there are very few opportunities. Socialization is a, a key point. That transition planning is critical. Transportation is always a barrier <clears throat> in some communities more than others. We know we need better healthcare systems and we know that we need community-based supports and services. So we started to map out what was available in the community um, by various providers and what could we do to help fill those gaps. <clears throat> so this is a hierarchy of our cradle to career programs. They kind of fall into three buckets. We look at helping families navigate the programs, the transition to adulthood, and then looking at collective impact. Because when you're talking about lifespan supports and services, it really does take a community. For today's presentation, we're gonna really focus on a few key things. One is our Unicorn Connection Center where we do vocational training and employment and a career and entrepreneurial institute as well as lifelong learning. And then from the collective impact side, we're talking about our special needs advisory coalition and a, an innovative virtual hub that we've been able to develop as part of that partnership. So our expectations, our goals and our impact is we really wanna improve access to efficient information and referrals to members of the community. We wanna to continue to expand our collaborative partnerships, improving the quality of life through increased competency of skills and building social capital. And when I say social capital, these are your friends and your network of family members and community members that are all there to support individuals with disabilities. Ultimately, we hope to address disparities, whether it's persons of color, um, varying levels of education, we wanna focus on inclusion, economic support, social recreation, accessibility, which is key, and opportunity. And to increase expectations of what is possible. And this is really important. Um, as a member of APSI, the Association for People Supporting Employment First, we understand that the probability of an individual getting a job is really based on the high expectations of parents at an earlier age. And it can't be just the high expectations of parents. It needs to be the high expectations of business people. It needs to be the high expectations of community. If we can redefine what's possible and let people see that, um, then we'll be able to drive more opportunities to create change. <clears throat> Our target audience is kids and young adults with developmental and learning challenges. However, we haven't excluded other disabilities in our conversations because I think we have a lot to learn from each other. So, you know, the deaf blind community can, can equally benefit from some of the strategies that we use with the developmental and learning disability community. We really wanna help families and caregivers feel empowered as the experts, and we wanna bring service providers into the fold. So again, in 2015, we did the community needs assessment um, that brought together a group of service providers, governmental agencies, foundations, parents, individuals with disabilities, um, to create this community to start with the dialogue. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Iris to give you more detail and information on what we've been able to accomplish with the Special Needs Advisory Coalition. And visual, there we go. Hi everyone. Okay, so the Special Needs Advisory Coalition is similar to what you would call an interagency um, committee or interagency collaboration that the school districts have. But it's a little bit stronger than just interagencies with the, with the school district. This is really pulling it together from all sides in, in the community. Um, we have members that are include the health department, children's medical services. Um, we have a children's service council. We have housing. We have county councilor members on, on our committees. Um, we include CARD, NAMI, which is the National um, Association for Mental, Mental Illness, um, advocacy groups, and 
school districts, public and private financial planners, attorneys, legal aid, and it, the list just goes on and on and on. Um, so we, when we meet, we are meeting to discuss and focus on particular areas. So we provide information on highlighting an agency and the services that they provide. And then we break into smaller groups that discuss the, the um, key initiatives. And we first started with, with doing the initiatives. Sharon, you can go on to the next slide. Um, with the key in initiatives being the focus point. And then we moved to going into initiatives that were based on age groups. So that we focused on different things for those age groups. Um, I'm going fast so that we can get to all the other things too. For the, the transition and adulthood area, these two groups are really focusing on uh, advocacy, career readiness, and getting, getting families prepared for when that yellow bus stops and what, what's next. And we all know that there's, you know, there's that gap there. Um, and we're also looking at adulthood. So one of the things that we did as a special needs advisory and all these community people, um, Sharon charged me with, with coming together to help create the virtual hub. And what we did is we, we met and each person wrote down, um, gave input to what services they have. And um, we created the virtual hub. The virtual hub is called special needs PBC dot info. And um, Carrie, can you put that into the into the chat box for me, please? And I'm going to share what we we created. Um, this was this is a special project of mine that I have thoroughly enjoyed working on. And let's see, two. So the virtual hub, you come in and you have each of the different areas um, of the of of age groups. So we're going to just focus in on each one. We had topics that the community felt were really necessary for um, the families to be able to navigate. And then Sharon also wanted us to be able to, to talk about um, having information there for families that, that um, I didn't get this right, that would help them as they're, they're navigating life. And so we came up with this overview and the overview kept expanding and expanding because we wanted to include all disabilities. So not only is it your typical categorical disabilities that you see in schools, but also you may have disabilities that just all of a sudden show up. One of, when I was writing all, all of this, one of my neighbors came through and she goes, Iris, my daughter is, is 26, and she's all of a sudden experiencing all these um, symptoms, and they think she has MS. And um, so they were going through that whole diagnosis, and she was just like, I don't know what to do. So using something like this is very important. Or that family that, that and, and I'm in South Florida, so um, every once in a while, we get these naive kids that think jumping off a bridge is really cool to do, and then they end up having spinal cord injuries. And families are just like, okay, what do we do? It's the same thing as what happened to our, our um, keynote speaker the other day. How do you navigate those changes? And who is your Georgia? So this website is to be the Georgia. So we have information here on the side, and it is lengthy. And we'll probably be making some changes to the, the view of how you see this information. Um, but it goes through a lot of different areas. And this was written not only um, by me, but also by other people in the community that were experts in that area. And we did a lot of resources on that. But on the learn more section, these were the topics that everybody wanted to know. And they follow a certain 
um, type of guidelines. So under early intervention, we include things that are relevant to the age group, mental health and risk of suicide, eating disorders and behavior management are the early intervention things that you would see for teenagers. So I'm just going to click on mental health and hopefully my computer will be coming together. And so it shows you the warning signs of, of the illnesses and some descriptions that are of different illnesses and some videos for families to watch so that they can get an idea. And then as you scroll down, it gives you how can a parent access these services, recommended websites, and then your references of who to, who to call. And we do these these areas are on each of each topic. They're it's consistent. So we did this with each age group. And you can see that the, the menu stays the same on the side um, for each. So in in the school section, because I know you guys are are, are K-12 um, folks, so we have IEPs. And we, we talk here about what is an IEP and what to expect. Um, coming from, I'm retired from a school district, so I do know that there are issues sometimes with, with um, IEP planning and, and parents not quite understanding everything with an IEP. So we included that whole process and researched the state information to make sure that we were covering everything. Um, so we, we provide a lot of information for families in regards to what to expect at an IEP meeting. But also we provide them information about what do you do when, you're, when you disagree and trying to get that to be more of a, a, a teamwork planning rather than an adversarial type of meeting. Um, so that is the website. Um, it, it's very cool. We do this for every age group. Um, we, we have, it took a couple of years to, to put it together, um, but it does have, let me go back up to the top. Um, each of the age groups are divided up. We have babies and we have preschool, elementary age, adolescence and transition, nine through 17, Young adults or emerging adults is 18 to 30 because that, that age group has a little bit of different type of uh, perspective on life. Middle adulthood, seniors, and then finding resources. So the finding resources with our 211, we have collaborated with them to create a 211 for special needs. And so everything is connected with 211 on this page and it does go through it has the same type of <coughs> of setup but gives you what what type of um services are available in our community for for this type of of need and it they can also go through and call um the, the 211 so um, this is just one of our initiatives. Now you saw too on on the website that we we had that COVID um, survey. One of the things that Sharon has been very um, strong with working on is getting getting COVID shots for people with disabilities, and actually became she was scheduling for a while all of the um, for the families to get those those shots for their, or vaccinations for their family members. <laughs> oh, excuse me. So we meet monthly. We, we do have employment opportunities. We've had job fairs. We've had um, housing initiatives and housing meetings where we work with trying to solve some housing problems for, for families and um, the virtual hub. So. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Carrie now to talk about the Connection Center. 
Thank you, Iris. And uh, one more facet about the um, virtual hub that I love. If you all are scrolling on that page now, scroll all the way down to the bottom. There's some blog articles there. We welcome you all to submit a blog article on the topic of your um, specialty area or families or parents. Um, we really want to make this a, a collaborative and community page. So that is one way that you can become involved right away with our virtual hub. So um, if you uh, would like to do that, you can reach out to either one of us um, and submit an article. Uh, so it's very exciting. So as Sharon mentioned, um, the newest project, the Unicorn Connection Center, is a building in downtown Boca Raton. And you can see there uh, the overhead view. Um, what's neat about uh, this movement into, you know, this urban um, area and this large building is that uh, we have access to um, a large apartment complex above. It's in downtown Meisner Park, if you're familiar with Boca Raton area. Uh, hustle bustle, there's lots of businesses around. It's a very vibrant community. And we are eager to um, launch our initiatives within this community um, so that we can really get our young adults um, out and as part of an inclusive environment. So uh, that's just an overhead shot to show, um, you know, where the decision was made to uh, start these programs and, and these key focus area um, launched programs. So we want to connect to resources, as Sharon had mentioned. Um, you know, improving those competencies and knowledge, not only to um, the agencies and, and the schools and the parents, um, but also to the individuals. We want to make sure that um, we not only develop um, new relationships, but improve our connectedness with the relationships that we currently have uh, as a foundation in our county and, and as part of the state. We also feel that it's important to secure industry standard certifications and job skills. Um, you know, so often our, our folks are building resumes, but um, employers really uh, take a second look at a resume if they see that there's an industry standard certification in a certain area. Um, so we think that that, uh, you know, gives them a leg up on the competition. And so we want to make sure that any of our training is connected to those associations within the industry. Uh, and through that, also improving economic stability of our, our young guys entering the workforce and uh, professional development for the community. So you'll see here some images um, of our enterprises as part of that um, building at the Unicorn Connection Center. We are very excited to launch the Uniquely Gifted Boutique, which is a retail environment um, focused on you know, selling products uh, that are made by individuals with disabilities. Uh, of course, we weren't able to open in March of 22. Uh, we have some construction still to be done to the space, um, but we're very excited to look into retail um, and we started an online Etsy store instead. So <clears throat> if you all would like to go to our Etsy store and support us, um, you'll see the name of the Etsy store is Uniquely Gifted UCF. Um, Iris, uh, maybe you can type that into the chat. Uh, so you can go online, you can shop. Um, our partners, Aspire Accessories. We have Allison from Doggy Delights uh, there, Sensibility. Um, and a couple of other partners that support our mission are selling their products on our site. If you all have any students or um, individuals that have their own products that they make, we welcome new partners to join us on the Etsy store. And there's a link on the Uniquely Gifted Boutique Partner website there. Um, and I provided the link on the bottom there. So um, I'm happy to talk to them about how to become a partner and sell their products on our Etsy store. So it's nice that even though we're all virtual, we got our Etsy store launch and then we'll bring some of those vendors into our, um, our, our brick and mortar store once we open. Another enterprise that um, we are excited to get going is our Special Perks Cafe. It's been a long time in the making. Um, Sharon has worked tirelessly um, to make this become a reality. You can see the renderings there uh, for the Special Perks Cafe, also at that Meisner location. And if you can picture, you know, being under an apartment building and next to a Bank of America building, we think that that's a nice hustling and bustling area for folks to come in and, and grab a coffee. 
um, and get served kindness one cup of it at a time. So it's a nice way to not only teach the community about our mission, but also um, put together a business um, that brings revenue into our programs. Um, so with that, um, we also, the programs are going to be out of our lifelong learning lab um, and our, we're focusing really on programs uh, around those two enterprises. So with the cafe being retail um, and also the boutique being retail and then also barista training, which I'll talk <clears throat> a little bit about as well. So all of our classes are broken up into um, these categories of lifelong learning, employment and social. Uh, these are off offered now. You can see um, some of them are still um, are in operation and then uh, we have breakfast club starting soon. We're still recruiting for that. We have a healthy living club starting on Thursday. If any of your students um, are interested in attending some of our evening sessions, uh, we have photography uh, starting today. That's actually during the day, but we have a, a great Spanish club. Cake decorating is always fun. Um, so we really wanted to try and put together classes that are not offered elsewhere. Um, in this virtual world and we're serving students from Texas and Washington and uh, Maryland all over the country, which has been unique. Um, and this is, these classes are for students of all ages. Um, although predominantly uh, we've seen transition age students and adults in these classes, just based on the need. I mentioned briefly the cafe and our barista training program. Uh, what's unique about this program is that we have partnered with Specialty Coffee Association to offer a certification from them. Um, you can see in one of the photos, um, the instructor Renee, she is a certified trainer uh, and her background is coffee. Uh, so she has taught the students all of the skills needed. Unfortunately, we're just virtual right now, but we're hoping to transition onto campus so that they could get some hands-on experience of, of barista training and then um, training those individuals on our site in order to give them the opportunity to either work at the cafe or neighboring coffee um, restaurants and cafes. You can see Iris there, uh, she's teaching our job club. Um, so that's obviously a fundamental class for not only those looking for employment, um, so that pre-employment kind of what you would consider under VR, that 20 or 40 hour course, but then also, you know, keeping up with job skills. So um, we are not currently a VR vendor. So this, um, this class is really open to anyone of all ages, which is nice that we don't have to um, be selective uh, in our process. Um, and it's really nice to bring together groups that um, some that have jobs, some that do not. So, um, you know, Iris works with them at the level that they're at to really try and progress their skills. The Breakfast Club is great. Um, we talked about partnerships and this is a, a, a great example of a partner. Um, Debbie Lombard has been in the um, Broward County community for, for years. Um, she started a, a company called Exceptional Theater Company. Um, and now works at a JCC in um, Broward County. And I have worked with Debbie for many years. And I said, you know what, Debbie, uh, would you teach a, a class for us? And sure, um, you've been in the community a long time and she's great with our guys. So she teaches a breakfast club in the morning. Um, and that's just one example of leveraging the partnerships that we have uh, to teach these wonderful classes. Another example, we partner with Remarkable um, Disability Services. So they're a great group. They teach our Connection Club, which is more of a social club. Again, these classes are open. If you have students that are interested in signing up, this class is at five o'clock. Um, so they can sign in after school and it's really a way for them to meet new friends. Spanish Club has been one of our most popular classes. We actually have a, a mom of our, uh, one of our junior board members that teaches that class. Um, and it's just a really fun interactive class for them to learn entry level Spanish. And then cake decorating, we've partnered with um, Chocolate Spectrum. If you're familiar with Valerie Herskowitz, she has a business um, and a son with autism here in Jupiter, Florida. So she teaches um, folks how to um, you know, use couplers and the cake bags. And as you can see, I'm learning myself. Um, so they bake goods and then they decorate them. Uh, so it's a skill either that they learn um, just for professional development, um, put it on their resume or just having fun with their family. So. Carrie, um, I just wanted to, sorry, I was yeah. just going to let you know, we have about five more minutes um, yeah. in the session. Just 
in case, yeah, sorry, I didn't Thank wait. you. No, this is great. I'm taking note. Okay. <laughs> so you can see the timeline there. Um, we have um, started, you know, the planning process in May of 2021. Um, now we're into that uh, second phase going into expanding those partnerships and we are getting ready to have in person programming on the campus that we've been waiting, um, you know, so long for. So we've had some challenges um, recently of uh, virtual instruction burnout, of course, keeping instruction engaging for all learners, um, including those guys that are nonverbal and it's difficult for them to participate in virtual classes. Um, and it's been difficult to build a sense of community. But what we have seen is we've been able to build flexible programming to meet the needs and interests of all sorts of individuals in our community and beyond. We've recruited talented instructors and made great partnerships from all areas. Um, and we've been able to serve participants worldwide and increase our numbers. I want you all to know that we have an exciting conference. Last December, we had the Creative Workforce Solutions Conference focusing on entrepreneurship. So please mark your calendars. It's on our website. If you're interested in coming, you have students that have their own businesses or you would like to be a speaker, we have our um, speaker applications open. We'd like to learn about your school-based businesses if you have one or social enterprises. So save the date for this December. So you can see there are outcomes to grow programs, um, serve more clients. Uh, we're very excited. We just started an Apricot 360 tool um, to track some of our data, not only with our programs, but with our um, collaborations uh, within the county, our SNAC data as well. Um, and we've been doing a lot of surveys and focus groups to continue on. So what can you all do? Um, you know, tell everybody about the Etsy store shop, um, get folks to partner up with us, share information about our classes and programs, please. Uh, if you'd like to become an instructor, we are looking for instructors. So teachers out there that wanna teach an extra class in the evening, um, you can join our snack group as a guest speaker if you have a topic that you'd like to share. Um, we also want you to share the virtual hub information with families and then get engaged with our Creative Workforce Solutions Summit in December. If you'd like to present, then there's an application on our website. Thank you, Carrie. So I, we wanted to save a few minutes for Q&A and I'm willing to stay over if, if there are, or you, um, we'll, we'll share our, com, our contact information. But you know, some of our lessons learned, again, as Carrie stated, is build your village. And um, we're happy to share with you in uh, we did share our um, executive summary of our community needs assessment, which lists all of our SNAC participants um, who collaborated on that initial community needs or community assessment plan. Um, collaboration is key. Right now, I think this year we've all learned a big lesson, um, you, you know, throw the spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. So we're all about testing and tweaking. If something works, great. Can we improve on it? Great. If it doesn't work, how can we modify it? Um, technology is here to stay. We really need to embrace it. Um, it was a crazy shift going from in-person programs and supports uh, last February to March having to be all virtual. Um, virtual is here to stay. It's really allowed us to increase our geographic outreach. Our instructors are coming from as far away as France and England. Um, so it's a, it's a great opportunity. You know, we're now talking with an organization in Hawaii on how we can connect their students to our students. Um, but key focus is, you know, how do you build sustainability into your plan? Uh, my next slide is our contact information. Um, again, our virtual hub, while, it's while it looks specific to Palm Beach County, the content is really universal. Um, so if you're interested in building a special needs advisor coalition in your community or um, interested in um, helping modify that virtual hub to fit the needs of your community, um, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we're happy to provide that support. Uh, we didn't operate in a silo when we did it. We reached out to the community and we're all about not recreating will, or, or, you know, re, you know, recreating the will. We've We've been there, we've done it. So we're here to help anybody else who might be interested in doing anything. And um, if we, I, get, I know we're a couple minutes over, but if there are any questions, we're happy to, um, to acknowledge those.
I just I'd like to ask a quick question. Can you yes. hear me? Okay. Um, I'm Tracy Bravo and I'm in Marion County. I was just curious. I am a teacher here at a center school, but I am also involved with a um, an organization that has the we call them members after they graduate, so the 22 and up. Do you guys also work with them in your Etsy store? Because I know they have a lot of um, enterprises going as far as making things, and that might be an outlet for them to get it out there to the public. 100%. Uh, yes, you know, our focus is our, our focus is really shifting to that 22 plus age group. Um, while we're focusing on lifespan issues, um, definitely, uh, I would suggest get in touch with Carrie and she can help you out with the next steps on that. Thank you very much. I have a question. Yes, Ruby. Hi, um, you mentioned earlier APSI and you said, you said what it meant, but you said it really quickly. And I was just wondering if you could tell me what that organization is. It's the Association for People Supporting Employment First. It's a national organization, but there are also state chapters. Carrie and I both happen to be on the Florida APSI board. In fact, we have a conference coming up in May um, on mental health and employment um, issues. So um, if, if you want to shoot us a quick email, we can send you information on that, on that particular conference, as well as the organization um, to become a member. Oh, okay. And just for wrapping up, um, I put the links in the in the conference app too. If you want the um, presenters, you can add external links if you want to um, include any other ones that you're referring to, just so they're not lost in the chat. Perfect. Thank you. And I think one last thing, don't forget to um, complete the session feedback survey. This is really helpful to help make sure that we have um, similar sessions in future conferences, because I know I took a ton of notes. I'd, I'm a little disappointed I did not know of this earlier and I've worked with Iris for years and I love hearing about this. This is so encouraging. So um, don't forget to fill out the, the session feedback because this is really helpful. And I did, I told Iris, I included as many links that I saw in the chat, but obviously if there's others, please feel free to add them. We are a little bit over. Um, you're more than welcome to head out to your next session. If you need to, we can stop recording. If we want to, um, we just need to get the Zoom room ready for the next session. But any other last questions or anything else we want to share before we start logging off? then I would um, suggest checking out the links. <laughs> I put five in there. So I, I got so excited looking at them all. I was like, oh, this is so cool. So thank you both, or actually an Iris too. Thank you all so much for sharing. This is really, really, really encouraging to you. I'm so glad I was in this session. Thank you so much for, for allowing us to share. And I wanna thank all who've attended um, for all the work you do. Um, because again, it does take a village to help mm. create these opportunities Absolutely. for our young adults so yeah Thank and, you. and we're here to help if you need if you want to start something like this in your community we are here to guide or help you and support you as as you go through that process thank you guys thank you all so much <laughs>